in the Toltec tradition, there's nothing to learn but to unlearn. To let go of all those things that doesn't allow us to see ourselves. So from that point, point of view, to accept yourself just the way you are, is to no longer project an image of who I'm supposed to be, but to take a breath and enjoy being the experience of who you are. This is who you are. Take a deep breath. And know that you are alive right now. And that's all you need. You don't need to convince anyone of your worth. Because you're alive right now. And understand all those things by which you rejected yourself before only had power because you believed it. And they stopped having power over you the moment you no longer believe. What's up, guys, and welcome to the Tapping Within podcast. On today's episode, we sat down with a spiritual guide, author, and a nagwal, meaning a master of transformation. He's a direct descendant of the Toltecs of the Eagle Knight lineage and is the son of Don Miguel Ruiz, author of the world-renowned book, The Four Agreements. When he was only 14 years old, Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. apprenticed to his father and his grandmother, Madre Sarita, to learn how they manifested their intent to heal people both physically and spiritually. By combining the wisdom of his family's traditions and the knowledge gained from his own personal journey, he now helps others realize their own path of personal freedom. After drawing upon ancient Toltec wisdom and getting all this exposure from great spiritual teachers, he's the author of the books The Five Levels of Attachment, Living a Life of Awareness, The Mastery of Self, and the Don Miguel Ruiz Little Book of Wisdom. In this episode, we cover everything from how our greatest teacher is death, why we attach to things, the illusion of our identity and our ego, the key steps to forgive and heal, cultivating self-acceptance, and more transformational wisdom. To keep getting exposed to spiritual guides and world-class leaders and teachers, make sure to subscribe to this channel now for videos every Wednesday and Sunday. So, without further ado, we present you a crash course conversation for mastering the self with Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. Don Miguel Ruiz Jr., how are you? Welcome to the podcast. Emilio, thank you so much. I'm doing very well. Thank you so much. How are you? Doing good, doing good. We were just uh, finishing up our conversation in Spanish <laughs> from from your Mexican origins and, and I'm Colombian. But I wanted to start with you. Uh, first of all, I wanted to just thank you for being here and the books that you've written. It seems like you've had a great amount of inspiration in your life and mentors uh, from your grandmother, Madre Sarita, to your, your father, Don Miguel Ruiz. And I wanted to start because in the beginning of one of your books, The Five Levels of Attachment, your father actually mentions in the foreword that you spent the great portion of your life silently rebelling against the way other people live, creating many judgments and opinions. Um, and then he mentions that you started to get attached to these judgments and opinions. Mm -hmm. I feel that that's something that I've been working through lately. And a lot of people my age, young people, don't really understand the depths of how our attachments can really impact our life. Um, but first, I want to do just dive into your upbringing, this rebellious phase that you've had, because I know growing up with a curandera, grandmother, a faith healer, and then a medical doctor, dad, you had a lot of uh, mixture and exposition to ways of healing. So how was that um, upbringing for you? And, and what did you what did you learn in, in that phase? Well, it was interesting, you know, apparently in our family, it's a tradition to rebel against the tradition. You know, my father rebelled against it, my grandmother rebelled against it. And then life happens that makes us switch to a certain point. Mm -hmm. My grandmother had uh, one of her sons uh, passed away and her grieving made her sick. So she had this aha moment in, in the healing. So she went back to her roots and she was so grateful for the healing she got from 
um, non-traditional uh, medication, or you can say the healing uh, of the curanderismo, of faith mm -hmm. healing, that she decided to continue and share that healing with her father, Don Leonardo, and continue that practice. And my father also rebelled against it. You know, he was a born in 1952, and he was a child of the 60s. So mm -hmm. he became a medical doctor, as well as my uncle, who became a neurosurgeon. My uncle became an oncologist. You know, they're the youngest of uh, 13 children. So they rebelled against it. And then he had an aha moment that he couldn't explain. He got into an auto accident that he had this auto body experience that he saw himself helping all the people get out of the car, whatever when the before the impact of the accident and then when he woke up he remembers all this uh moments this out-of-body experience and he only went to the person he trusted which just at the time was don leonardo my grandmother's father and don leonardo began to teach him as well as my grandma sarita and they really took the helm on teaching him dreaming so you can say a few years later my father lets go of being a medical doctor and goes full time to the transition into what we know as Anahuatl. Mm -hmm. And during that transition, he begins to clean up the superstition that surrounds the Totec tradition at that time. And he puts it into a language that he calls common sense. You can say that in his med medical experience and the tradition, he found a language that he was able to let go of that which didn't serve and kept only what mattered. The example of that would be the Four Agreements. You know, the Four Agreements is an example of how he cleaned up the Toltec tradition and put it in a language that we can all understand. Mm. Under that backdrop comes me. So I was raised with juxtaposition, uh, dualities. You know, I had a, grand, a faith healer for a grandmother and a father who was a neurosurgeon. Uh, my mother was a dentist. Uh, I, there was spirituality at home and academia. In the school, you know, I was part of the International Baccalaureate, and then mm. eventually uni uh, University of California, San Diego. At the same time, I lived in San Diego, California, and I commuted every day into Tijuana, Mexico. So I did the opposite direction. You know, uh, uh, I commuted every day into Mexico to go to school in Mexico, even oh, though wow. I was in the United States. Okay. So I kind of was. I grew up with that duality of juxtapositions mm. of culture, not only. You know, every day I would wake up in a country that we all speak English, and by the time I go to school, I speak in, I'm speaking. I'm I'm going to a school where everyone speaks Spanish, and then I come home to a place where everyone speaks English. So my English is what it is. My Spanish and my English are, you know, kind of like, uh, convoluted there. But that's the way I grew up. I always grew. I I was surrounded com uh, completely by dualities of contrasting cultures and. You kind of kind of form there so my rebellion was i wanted to live my own life because the thing growing up watching my grandmother is that there was a lot of fanaticism that surrounded her and i witnessed how that fanaticism grew around my father as well and i kind of didn't want that in my life i didn't want that experience i wanted my own life and i studied film and video production with an emphasis on art direction and uh photography um direction in school and college as well as a minor in theater and so sociology. That's what I studied and I began to work. Now, mind you, I apprenticed with my grandmother at the age of 14 and I translated for her for 10 years because she's super young. English. Yeah. So that was that was the form that my apprenticeship with a family was. And I did it because I love my grandmother. Most of the time, domestication happens because you love the person that teaches you. In this case, even though it wasn't domestication traditional, I learned the family tradition by helping my grandmother in her own unique way. So I learned a lot from her from that in that way. A lot of the tradition, a lot of the concepts, because I was her voice in English yeah. for many, many years. My father always says, all right, I will teach you, but I won't intensify your teachings until you, after you graduate from college. Once you graduate mm -hmm. from college, I'm going to intensify your teaching because I need you to put your attention on your education, which I did, you know. So my rebellion came, you know, in creating, like we were talking before the interview, creating an identity of myself. And when you go into an, a college or a university, there are so many directions. You're exposed to so, to so much knowledge. And 
everyone domesticating themselves into that image of what should be, what is cool, what's acceptable, what's knowledgeable, what's academic. The duality went beyond that. You know, it wasn't just two worlds. It was a plethora of directions and finding your way, finding your voice. And oftentimes I disagree with a lot of it because I was able to see the contradictions in everything. So there's my rebellion. I, I was always seeing contradictions and never really buying into it. And then I graduated college and the bubble burst and my father intensified his teachings. And I had this moment where I understood a lot of things. And then all of a sudden I had to start all over again. Hmm. And little by little, I let began to unlearn a lot of the things that didn't help me. So you can say that, just to put as an example, the four agreements came out in 1997. I was 21 years old. I was I, negative one. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <Almost> there. <laughs> there you go. And then um, I bought the book. I around the third chapter, I put the book down because it, mm. to me, it was my dad telling me what to do all over again. That's how I see you sometimes growing up with a family that does this, you kind of see the teachings and philosophy in the form of domestication and whatnot. Yeah. You know, it was my dad yeah, telling me what to do all over again. Then life happens, the bubble burst. I had a huge heartbreak. For me, the, uh, the aha moment, the thing that came, life came and uh, gave me my aha moment that changed things was, one, my father had a massive heart attack, and mm. uh, he was in a nine-week coma, and I took so much responsibility as the eldest of the children. And then I lost someone I loved very, very much, and I couldn't project any blame. It was all me, and I wasn't that image that I thought I was. And all of a sudden, I hit my rock bottom, and I started all over again, and I picked up the book again. And I, at this time, I used it the way other people have used it. Yeah which is to help me. So at this point, I'm 27, 26 years old, some, somewhere around that age. And you can say that for the very first time, even though I've been apprenticing with a family since I was 14, it was, I was 26 or 27 when I really applied it in my life. And mm -hmm. little by little, I developed a voice that allowed me to put it into words. And the reason why I developed a voice is that I was learning from my own experiences. And you can say that's the basis of my teaching. You know, I, I teach the family tradition in my own unique way. Yeah. But it came from learning the lessons that life taught me. So you can say life is the biggest teacher I have. Hmm. I feel like the the base that you had from a very early age allowed you to have that aha moment because I mean a lot of us we might not have that background or even have heard these concepts before the book. So the book that you're referring to is the four agreements that your father wrote. I'm curious to know, like when you were 27 after that rock bottom, what was that initial feeling of, let me, let me go, go back to this book. And I really need to understand it again. Well, you can say heartbreak is the moment where the illusion ends and the truth begins and you're heartbroken because you really wanted that Im Im image, that illusion to be true. It's kind of mm -hmm. like Don Quixote. You know, Don Quixote didn't accept himself for who he was. So one day he fell in love with chivalry. He bought every book of chivalry and, and knight's errand. And one day he completely went into that world and he dubbed himself Don Quixote de la Mancha and did everything those books said he should do and yeah. avoided anything that wasn't if it wasn't in a book he didn't know what to do so in his world he sees giants because that is what don quixote is expected to see so if he sees giants he's worthy of the name don quixote de la mancha but if he sees windmills the windmills represent the truth he concocts a story that allows him to still see giants. Ah, oh, that magician, my arch nemesis, he turned every giant in the countryside into windmills just to make me look bad, to rob me of my opportunity to shine. Yeah. At that moment, he preferred the illusion over the truth because he is Don Quixote de la Mancha. 
if he accepts that those are windmills, his name is Alonso Quijano, or Quijones, depending on which edition you read. Mm. And he just does that not just with windmills, but with people in his life. Dulcinea is really Alonso, the, the barmaid at the local tavern, but he projects an image of Dulcinea, a, a young a princess who is now the, the focus of his love. The innkeeper is now a king, you know, he's just, a, and, and, you know, the, he keeps projecting onto this and he finds Sancho Panza and Sancho Panza, you know, he's, he, he goes to Sancho Panza because the innkeeper who he sees as the king tells him, you need a squire, you need someone to help take care of you because what proper knight doesn't have a squire. Mm. So he, he goes back home and he re, relapses into, illusion, into his illusion, finds Sancho Panza and says, if you follow me, the king will reward with so much treasure, he might even give you your own island. Sancho Panza sees that he is crazy, but he decides to follow him just in case he's right. How, what does that have to do with the question is that I am aware that I am this image by which I domesticate myself, that identity that we look for. We create a symbol with a definition in order to find ourselves and we grab that identity and we begin to domesticate ourselves with that image. And little by little, we get so wrapped up in that image that if we live up to it, we're worthy of the of love, of our own acceptance. But if we fall short of that acceptance or, or short, short of that perception of that expectation, then we're worthy of the punishment. And we reject ourselves. Por mi culpa, por mi culpa, por mi culpa. Mm. Punishing myself for not living up to that. That's what domestication is. I am Don Quixote. In my case, Miguel Angel Ruiz Jr., Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. And I'm also Sancho Panza. I know I'm crazy, but just in, I'll follow me just in case I'm right. Mm. So in that moment of clarity in my life, I became aware of that, that I wasn't who I pretended to be at the moment where, where my father had a heart attack and when I lost the woman I wanted to marry, the biggest heartbreak was that image I created for myself wasn't real. And I was the man who took things personal. I was the man who made assumptions. I took things personal. I wasn't doing my best. Just as my wife, she's my witness. It is the moment where I became aware of the truth of who I am. And before that, people would ask me, which one of the four agreements was the hardest one for you to follow? And I always answered taking things personal or, or being impeccable with the word. It was always those two that were always difficult. And then eventually I found out the reason why it was so difficult is it because I was pretending to be a man who did not take things personal and who was impeccable with his word. Hmm. That's why it was so difficult. And that moment I realized, well, I accept the truth. You see, conditional love only wants to see what it wants to see. In the same way, Don Quixote only wants to see giants. But unconditional love is the willingness to see life as is, which is Alonso Quijano accepting that those are windmills. I accept the truth of who I am. I stop pretending to be something I am not. And I accept, hello, my name is Miguel Angel Ruiz Jr. And I do take things personal. I am not impeccable with the word. I do make assumptions and I sometimes don't do my best. When that happens, it's that, all right, that whole world that I created for myself, that identity that we look for so much at a university and school with our friends, with social life, with, with our political ideas and agendas and uh, rom ideas of romance or ideas of what is to be a man, what is to be a woman, and all those kind of things come up uh, crumbling down because all of a sudden you give it a little bit of questioning and they fall apart because it's not the truth. It's just an idea. An example would be this. Hmm. The truth exists whether you believe in it or not. That's a Neil deGrasse Tyson quote. Yeah. The truth exists whether you believe in it or not, which means the truth doesn't need me for it to exist. For example, a black hole exists whether we prove it or not. You know, whether it's a theory, a fact, whatever. It exists. It doesn't need us for it to exist. A belief, in contrast, exists for as long as I say yes to it. As yeah. soon as I change that yes into a no, it ceases to exist, which means a belief only exists for as long as I believe it. The moment I no longer believe it, it ceases to exist, which means a belief needs me. 
for it to exist. It needs humanity for it to exist. If we can tell the difference between those two things, then my identity is a belief, it is not the truth. It is a symbol with a definition. Hmm. And if I domesticate myself with that, the worst thing that could happen is to prove it wrong. But if I get, who am I without my identity, it all comes coming, crashing down, so you protect it. From this point of view, it's easy to understand what ego is. Yeah. It's easier to understand ego as a function rather than a concept. The function of ego is to keep the illusion alive, to protect the illusion. What illusion? That identity by which we domesticate ourselves. In the same way that Don Quixote protects everything he sees in order to live up to Don Quixote. But it all crumbles down the moment you accept the truth. Alonso Quijano, in this my case, Miguel. That heartbreak, you know, it can be very hard. Mm. And a lot of pride, personal importance takes a hit, which always hurts. You know, we're still emotional beings. So when those things happen in life, you have a choice to continue that cycle, to let it go. A moment of clarity without any action is just a thought that passes in the wind. But a moment of clarity followed by action becomes a pivotal moment in our life. It's the same as saying as an alcoholic or drug addict that one day wakes up from the stupor of what they've done and they see the truth of what they've created. At that moment, they have a choice to continue or to let go. If they continue is that they know they have a hangover and the only way to get rid of it is to do the, the hair of the dog, which is to drink another beer and the hangover goes away and you punt it, you know, and the cycle continues. Or you switch direction, you say, you know what, that's it, I'm going to let go of drugs and alcohol, and you go through detox, the hard part of detox. Yeah. And little by little, you get better and better and better. That's when that moment of clarity becomes a pivotal moment in our life. Mm. Well, in my life, that moment was, you know, when I hit that rock bottom, and that heart, that rock bottom was based that, I wasn't who I pretended to be. And I couldn't lie to myself anymore. I couldn't go back into the bubble. Hmm. I couldn't recreate the bubble. This is me. And that's what makes me take the steps. And I picked up the book because I went to the one thing I relied on. Or you can say, I knew that it could help. And there was a four agreements. And, it, and I used it in a way that I saw myself in it, and I began to understand it. And as my dad recovered from his heart attack, and he needed help, and help me by that when he gave a lecture, his heart didn't have enough power to keep him going through a two hour lecture. So my brother and I would help him, like he would be on stage, he would look at me and kind of like in wrestling, they ask for a tag team, tag you're in. We will go in there and, and help him. And little by little, I put into words that which I was understanding from the book. And that's how I kind of processed this concept and began to help me. But I, it, for me, it was there were instruments of healing. Yeah. And that's what I did. I didn't use it for ego. I didn't use it for anything. I began to use it as an instrument to help me understand myself. Hmm. Amazing. I really, really love that story. And one of the... One of the quotes in, in your book, your latest book, The Master Yourself, that resonated with me so much, I had to like write it down somewhere, share it with people. And, and it's that, that same concept of a lot of these things will happen in our life and we may not be able to see what is clearly going on in that situation mm -hmm. um, in terms of loss or, you know, complete change in our lives like for me it was moving around uh in my early days it was just having to move around because of my dad's job and having to adapt and in the moment you don't understand why and you just are holding on to all these things but what you said in in the mastery of self towards the end is that sometimes there needs to be a distance between you and the event before you see that the truth i'm quoting the truth of its teaching but if you look closely at the situation in your past, when you didn't get what you wanted, you got exactly what you needed instead. That's amazing. Like, I, I really love that. Um, 
And it might take some time, right, to to really understand that what we need is what we have in the moment. What would you say to someone that is fighting this present moment or they don't understand why, you know, the pandemic hit or their girlfriend had to leave the country or all these other things that may happen in our lives? What, what would you what would you say to someone like that? There's a lot there, but I'll go with my first reaction to, mm -hmm. to the question and the story. You get what you need. It reminded me of a teaching that I've learned ever since, you know, um, um, about a year after uh, The Master Yourself came out, I was uh, giving a class on it. And I talked to a teacher and the teacher actually gave me a beautiful instrument um, of, of a real, a real aha. Forgiveness is the moment you no longer wish the past was any different. It is the moment you accept it and you let it go. That's what forgiveness is. To accept it simply means that you know that the past, I can't go back in the past and change a yes to a no or no to a yes. There's no amount of what ifs that will ever change it. The only place where the past exists is in our mind in the form of a memory. And that's the way it happened. I can't go back there and change it in the same way that the future doesn't exist yet. It only exists in my mind as a form of, as a form of my imagination. And there's no amount of what ifs to actually impact it until the moment the future becomes the present, which that means that the only place where I'm able to make a choice is in this present moment. Mm. So forgiveness is the moment you no longer wish the past was any different. It simply means that it's the moment where you no longer well, obviously, don't want it to change it, but you accept it. It happened. And I can't change it. It's it's a done deal. It's a moment of our lives. And the next phrase is, and then you let it go. To me, that image that comes up is one of my brother Jose's imagery and his teachings of that of a scorpion that stings itself over and over again with its own tail administering itself the poison that it meant for someone else, but gives them to himself. You can say that every time we think about the past, the scorpion stings itself, hurting ourselves over and over and over again. To let it go is simply the moment where the scorpion decides to no longer use that moment in the past to hurt us in the present. And that's what forgiveness is. The moment I no longer use someone else's actions or something that happened with me to hurt myself over again. The only reason why that moment in time is still impacting us is because we haven't let it go. We've used it to identify ourselves with, we've used it to uh, reinforce whatever domestication we have or insecurities we have or whatnot. The list can go on. We're all individuals and we all do it in a different way. To process that is to understand how we've done that but the constant is that every time we think of that moment we hurt ourselves now mind you some wounds are much heavier than others some some mm -hmm. wounds are still so fresh and they hurt a lot and we respond with anger we resp respond with joy we respond with hate we respond with fear we respond with jubilation we're human beings with the full spectrum of our emotions and we're all going to react differently so some moments in time happen that way. The question is what I'm going to do now. You see, at this very moment, I'm the sum of every decision that I've ever made. Every choice, every action, every consequence, good, bad, right, or wrong, has brought me here. Hmm. Who I am right now is the sum of all that and has led me here. Like I, 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 the, the image of you two from Sioux uh, Station, my face passed up against the glass going on a train and your face completely in the front of it. That's how I, it feels like it. And <laughs> freight trains and getting bigger and bigger and bigger with every experience. Yeah. But at the same time, as that's happening, yes, I'm the sum of every decision that I've ever made. But at the same time, I'm the youngest I will ever be. I have my whole life ahead of me. If someone were to take a picture of me right now, and I look at that picture in a few years, I'm gonna say, look at how young I was. 
I know that because now I'm looking at pictures that someone took of me some time ago, a week ago or a year ago or 10, and I'm going to say, look at how young I was. I am the youngest I will ever be. As that's the truth, when I was a baby, as it is right now, I'm the infinite possibility because I'm alive. Which means at this very moment, I can go in any direction in life. I can say yes to whatever I want to say yes to and no to whatever I want to say no to. My no is just as powerful as my yes. Am I going to allow my past to continue to impact my present? Not my future, forget about the future. I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but this present. You know, my grandma always used to say, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. <laughs> yeah. your plan. You know, it's like this past year is an example. You know, it's like we had 2020, we were supposed to have all this stuff, and all of a sudden it all came to a mean halt. Crashing down, yeah. So you lo I lost a lot of work, a lot of things, but what did I gain? A whole year with my family. Mm. I got what I needed. Yeah. So in my life, that's going to be, and it's going to be different for all of us. You know, I, I, I did lose four uncles, one cousin, and one classmate from elementary school to this disease. Wow. You know, it's, it's, wow. It's, it's, it's something that impacts all of us. Mm. And there's that side where we, we mourn. And the reason why we mourn is because we love. But at the same time, we're surrounded by the people we love. And it's a good time to heal anything that separated us. And in this case, my wife and my kids, my parents and all that, we were in our own bubble and we spent a whole year together and it was a wonderful time for us. Of course, we had to take care of each other to learn how to, you know, to maneuver, who will get the food. And we, we went back to the basics, but I can use what happened last year and just fo focus. I could focus on what I didn't get or I can pay attention and be grateful for what I got. And really, that is the choice. I can use it again and again to hurt myself, or I can use it to learn from. And there's a huge difference between that. And usually, the difference is healing. We heal with our own permission. We heal. And usually, what doesn't give us permission is a domesticated idea of who we're supposed to be. I'm supposed to be a man. I'm Mexican. I am macho, whatever. <laughs> but if I let that idea, get in the way. No, I'm not, I'm not supposed to show weakness. I'm not supposed to show that I'm wounded. What kind mm -hmm. of man am I? If I have that, then that's exactly what stops me from healing. I heal with my own permission, which means I let go of that, which stops me from getting that permission. And I give myself the permission to heal. And that's where you can say my grandma and my father taught me that with uh, Western uh, medicine and non-traditional medicine, homeopathic medicine, if you want to use that term to describe it, both are there to help us. And all we require is to give us permission to heal and look for what resonates with us. Sometimes holistic, sometimes Western, whatever it is, we will use. And that's the beauty of it. So yes, we've all gone through this uh, tough times. You know, we've lost people we love. You know, relationships ended. Uh, experiences didn't happen. You know, you're about to graduate from university and you don't know if you're going to walk. You know, that big traditional ceremony. <laughs> you're in the idea of what a virtual graduation. graduation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you were so attached to it, should have been this that image that you grew up with yeah. envisioning your graduation day. You can use that to make you feel pain, make you get angry. You can use that to go, Grr! or you look at what the ceremony is supposed to uh, represent, your accomplishment. Hmm. Your accomplishment is worth more than the ceremony was that was created to celebrate it. You can still celebrate it in your own unique way. Because here's the thing, when we grow attached to it, we will f miss it. We will completely miss it because it won't look the way we want it to look. Yeah. But if we accept it, it's here and it's great. And to me, I equivalent, I equate that or it's equivalent to me saying this. If you're so attached that the only way to find intimacy between people is to hug, I hug you, I hug you. And if you think that's the only way to find that intimacy, then you're going to miss out on the opportunity when you meet that one someone that for them to open up that much is painful.
It's it's too much for them. It, it I can't hug. It's just it mm. hurts. Different love language, whatever. <laughs> but they want to have that embrace, so they'll reach out their hand. If you're so attached to the image, it has to be a hug. You're gonna miss out on the wonderful opportunity that this person is giving, which is this is the extent of how much I'm able to open up. And if you shake that hand, it may not be what you expect it to be, but you realize that you're having a moment of communion. It's the same with relationships. It's the same with friendships. It's the same with all kinds of relationships. You're going to a moment where it didn't, it doesn't, what you expected wasn't going to happen, but you can still rewrite it and still find a way to celebrate your accomplishment because your accomplishment in your graduation from the university is a wonderful moment in time. And it's up to you. Are you going to let the attachment of what is supposed to be take you away and blind you and miss it? Or are you going to be able to detach enough to be able to see what's in front of you? Mm. A moment to say, I did it. Yeah. And I was able to share it with the family, even digitally. And mm. that's the communion. When we get attached to something, we miss out on the opportunity for that communion. Mm. And that's, I think, also with really anything, um, when you, when you uh, project your image of what you want the future outcome to look like mm -hmm. and then we we really attach to to a certain thing i think one of the hardest things is what you're just saying is that detachment phase what does it take to build up to that and and how can we start seeing that we actually have the option and then it's not really an, an attachment it's not um mm. it's something that we have to have it's it's something that you know it would be a yeah. nice to have or um uh, even even seeing it from a different perspective but but that's really fascinating the detachment part of it yeah it's uh when we attach to something it means that we're investing ourselves emotionally intellectually or energetically to something that's not a part of us it's yeah. like I'm, I'm attaching myself to this cup it's not a part of me but i, I attach myself to it and it's not just physical. It's like, all right, this cup represents me. It represents where I come from, California, my, my home state, born and mm -hmm. raised in California. All of a sudden, now I attach myself to this. This is just a material thing, but I just gave it a definition. It represents my home state. It represents me because this is where I was born. You know, all it is is just ink. Yeah. <laughs> right? So we get attached not to material things, we get attached to the meaning, the representation, what it means in our lives. That's what we attach ourselves to. And somehow we attach ourselves in a form of, it represents me. An attachment is healthy. It's, you can say, I engage a moment and I'm able to disengage. I engage and disengage, attach, detach, attach, detach. An attachment is a healthy thing that we humans do. What makes it unhealthy is that when the moment comes to detach, we can't. Mm. We can't let go. And all of a sudden, we're trying to hold on to something that no longer exists. It's in the past. And the only way to keep it here is to give myself the name of it or identify myself as that. I no longer live in California. I live in Nevada. Mm. <laughs> Got to change the ink. Or get, get a new coffee mug. <laughs> which I have, by the way. <laughs> and, and then from that point of view is that we get attached to objects in the form of our thoughts, our symbols, our representation. So it's a lot harder to detach from something that's non-tangible than it is something tangible. You know, like I was saying before, the truth exists whether I believe in it or not. If we can tell the difference between the truth and a belief, well, the truth is this is just matter it's something yeah. i will call a cup the belief is what it represents if you can tell the difference you're able to detach easy relationships it's a little bit more complicated but it's the same thing mm -hmm. every relationship is unique i am the constant in every relationship that i am in the moment i begin to attach myself to that is that i use it for my own personal importance I use it to identify myself with that relationship. 
I'm a married man, I'm a father. What happens when that I lose that? And who am I? Who am I without this relationship? And all of a sudden, it's no longer about the person who I'm in relationship with. It's about the status that the relationship gives me. Yeah. And that's the corruption of it. That's when I begin to domesticate myself and attach myself to that relationship. Hmm. But it's always about people and the connections because relationship only exists for as long as two people say yes to each other. When couples ask, come and ask me for advice, I always ask the same question. Do you guys want to stay together? If they both say yes, the rest is easy because that mutual yes is the motivator that allows us to get through a lot of hurdles. If they both say no, that's also easy it's because they both are sharing their truth and this relationship is over. Yeah. It's difficult when one says yes and the other one says no, that's a little it's bit like, more complicated because maybe. <laughs> yeah, you're trying to convince someone to do something they want to do and that's when it's more complicated. But every relationship exists like that. That's what the bond is. If I attach myself to this relationship through domestication or increase my level of attachment, then I'm doing this. Who am I without it? Yeah. If my wife leaves me, does that mean I'm a loser? I'm selfish? And now all of a sudden with that, it's not about losing my wife. It's about losing the relationship. You know, all of a sudden, who am I without it? And that's when the attachment becomes unhealthy because now I don't know life without it. I don't like, I don't know life without her. I don't know life without this relationship. Who am I without it? And that's where fear comes in, attachment comes in, and all this heartbreak comes in. Yeah. What's the illusion? Why waste, why waste my time with someone who doesn't want to be with me? Why waste my time with potential? I'm going to be with someone who does want to be with me. And the illusion is, I really projected that image of someone that they wanted to be with me when they weren't. And that's the illusion. That's, that's something I tell my kids. Don't waste your time with potential. Don't waste your time with someone who doesn't want to be with you. If someone leaves you or leaves you for another person, that person is doing you a favor. It means that you are no longer living an illusion. Why waste your time with it? Enjoy being yeah. with someone who wants to be with you. Don't stay with potential. That, that really resonated with me a lot. And sometimes life will make you detach real quick it won't even tell you it'll just like you have to uh those yeah. are the hardest i would say those are the hardest moments when we feel that we don't actually have a choice um you know that could be career-wise you get fired from one day or another or relationship-wise um you know the, the another third person gets involved or a lot of things can happen but it's difficult to see the the lesson behind behind that in those moments. So no. it's going full well, circle what we were talking about. Yeah, because the emotions sometimes blind us, but you know, we give ourselves time to heal. You know, we don't heal in a schedule, you know, we don't heal with you know a calendar, we heal with time and effort. Mm -hmm. Like I was saying before, like we heal with our own permission. So imagine that you get a cut in your arm. It, with some tender loving care, you know, with a little bit of, you know, you, you clean up the wound and you leave it alone, a scab will start growing, a costra in Spanish. And it'll cover the whole wound if you leave it alone. Once it covers the whole wound, if you leave it alone, with time it'll get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until it falls off showing new skin. Sometimes a scar, but scar sometimes means it's just the way new skin grew. Yeah. Now let's imagine not giving permission, which means somewhere along the growth of that scab, I scratch and scratch, scratch, it falls off and it bleeds again. And I say, see, I haven't healed. It's still bleeding. <laughs> it didn't heal because we didn't give it permission. We healed, we scratched on it. Now here's the thing. Our physical body heals in the same way our emotional body heals with a little bit of tender, loving care and patience. We heal with time. We heal with living. We heal by giving ourselves the opportunity to heal. Forgiveness is the moment you no longer wish the past was any different. It is the moment you accept it and you let it go. 
to not accept it and to not let it go I mean, it's the same thing as using it and continue scratching on it. Mm. Scratch, scratch, scratch until it bleeds again over and over and over again. Life happens, like I was, we were saying before, like my grandma used to say, if you want to make God laugh, tell, tell him your plans, tell her your plans. Life happens that way. So when that moment happens, what are you going to do? Are you going to use that to further hurt yourself? Or are you going to use that to, okay, that moment was over. What's next? You know, our greatest teacher is the angel of death. It gives as much as it takes. Every relationship ends. Every single one. By choice, by life, or by death. By life is me and my ex-girlfriend from uh, college. When we graduated college, the university, University of California, San Diego. She went back home. She moved back to Berlin. Mm. And I stayed in California. These are the days before social media. So we went our own ways. And you we had broke the, up. You had to send cards. <laughs> yeah, well, it was over because we both, you know, went our, we, we both continued our own life. We, all, we both continued our journey. In this case, the relationship ended. We didn't break up. We said goodbye because we just left. Had we stayed in the same place, we would have continued, but it didn't, we both went our life. So that's, by, we break up by life, it ends by life. By choice is the one we all know, break up. We break up because that yes changed into a no. That's what we know. And by death, one day my wife will see me close my eyes for the last time or she'll see, I'll see her close her eyes for the last time. That relationship ends. Mm -hmm. It's like accepting our mortality. One day, my relationship with this body and this mind will end because I have learned that I don't take it with me. I don't take my mind and I don't take my body with me. If we accept our mortality, the gift of accepting it that one day I am going to die is that I accept the mortality of everyone in my life because everyone in my life comes and goes in different facets. Relationship, we go, even with friends, we go into different directions. Sometimes we bef befriend ourselves, whatever. I am the only constant in my life. But the beautiful thing about accepting mortality, my mortality and the people around me, is that I no longer have to use that to hurt myself. Why waste my time waiting for a moment that's going to come? That day is not today. Like they say in Game of Thrones, what do you tell the angel of death? Not today. Today is not that day. So if you accept that every relationship will end, enjoy that we're saying yes to one another right now. Yes. Just like life is saying yes to me right now, we're both saying yes right now. Enjoy it. Embrace it. It is the thing that keeps us from taking someone for granted. Because that's what happens when you take from someone for granted, we, pay, we, we forget that it's by mutual choice and we take them for granted and we do all these kind of horrible things. But the moment we accept mortality and that the end of relationships are there, enjoy it. And all of a sudden, the thing that prolongs a relationship is there. We enjoy each other's company. And when the time comes to say goodbye, we'll say thank you so much. Because here's another truth. Every relationship is new. Even when you're with the same person, I've been together for 17 years. My, this weekend, my wife and I celebrate 17 years of being together. Wow, congratulations. She is not the same, thank you. Mm. She's not the same person I uh, she was when we were both 28. Yeah. She's we're not the same person we, when we were both 30, 35, 40, and I'll stop right there for her. <laughs> but we're changed. So even within the same relationship, we're not the same people. We're con constantly evolving. We're constantly changing. And the only reason why we're still together is because we both say yes. At any given moment, she can change her yes into a no. This ring only represents that we're both saying yes at this very moment. And it's not a shackle. She's not forced to say yes to me. The moment mm -hmm. she changes yes into a no, it's over. So you can say, that's when you love someone, set them free, is to respect them 
to say yes and no to things they want to say yes and no to. And if they stay, it's because they love. That's because we're saying yes. Yeah. Every person in life are living their free will, whether whether they're aware of it or not. And sometimes they're not aware of it because they're domesticated and subjugating their will to a certain point of view, but they just have to remember and their free will comes back. Or forgive themselves for saying yes to conditional love all that time. But every relationship ends. But today is not that day. My relationship with life will end. But today is not that day. Enjoy what we're both saying yes. And we will enjoy each other. And when it ends, we'll say thank you very much for that wonderful time. Wow. And like I said before, why waste my time with someone who doesn't want to be with me? It frees me up to find someone who wants to be with me. Mm. Yeah. And it's so important to set those boundaries and, and know when you have to to make those decisions. I guess it's a it's a feeling that you get. Um, sometimes we we might stay in a certain path longer than we should, but I mean, as you said, it's we're we're getting what we need when we need it, not what we when we want it. Um, and sometimes we stay longer because you know. First, I'll say in Spanish, we stay longer because of the el que dirán. What will they'll say? Yeah. The judgment people have, especially our own judgments. But mm -hmm. when we stay in a place in our relationship that no longer makes us happy, the only people who are suffering are the two people who don't want to be in the relationship. They're forcing each other to be in somewhere where they don't want to be. But every relationship evolves. You know, every every relationship changes. Sometimes a breakup is the thing that saves the relationship. I'm still friends with my college uh, girlfriend. We broke up after a year and a half, and then she became like my sister. And now she, her husband and I are good friends, and she is good friends with my wife. <laughs> and, the, and what saved that relationship is that one day, we realized that we were no longer romantically in love. We love each other, but not romantically. That's a big one. Um, one of the last concepts I want to hit with you is the the self acceptance part of it because a lot of the times we will um struggle to to accept ourselves as we are and always think oh there's something more that i need uh, i'm not this enough i'm not enough in general and that's one of the biggest things that that i was struggling with and i still struggle with before a lot of people younger my age i guess since our domestication is always you always have to look outside of you to to feel fulfilled, feel whole. What would you say to that? How do we cultivate that self-acceptance? Well, first, becoming aware of our domesticated point of views or conditioning, you know? Sometimes we use the word conditioning because we think only animals get domesticated. We humans don't get domesticated, we get conditioned. And right off the bat, you can see how we create a hierarchy. I'm better than someone, I'm better than this, I'm better than that. Domestication is created, like I said before, it's a system of reward and punishment by which we model the behavior of an individual. If we live up to the expectation, we're worthy of the acceptance, and if we fall short, we're worthy of the punishment. And since we are emotional beings who experience the full spectrum of our emotions, that reward feels like acceptance, which feels like love, and the punishment feels like rejection and the lack thereof of love. I love you if. I love you if it, you live up to my expectation of our family values. If you live up to the name, in my case, Ruiz. Um, I love you if you live up to this image of Prince Charming or, or, or the beautiful princess. I love you if you live up to this image. If you get straight A's, you are um, admiration. If you get F's or C's, then you're a reprobate and you're just no one. I'm going to treat you differently if you're head of the class as opposed to a lackey. And same thing with relationships. If you live up to this thing, this image, you're worthy of love. And if you fall short of that, so you can say, oh, and the other one, if you live up to expectation, you're cool, man. And if you're cool, <laughs> you'll get popularity. Yeah. But if you fall short of that expectation, you're not cool. And you're in fact, you're a, you're a square, you're a nerd, you're a geek. And not only will you not be popular, we're going to ostracize you until you get hip with it, man. Yeah. Yeah. And then you will not get cool. So, 
But here's the thing, we want to be part of a community. So when we get rejected by the in crowd, you know, the jocks and cheerleaders or whatnot, we create our own subculture. In my case, I create, I joined the goth kids and we all dress black and we listen to the <laughs> and the, the Smiths, you know, we, 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 I don't know what they call them nowadays, but back in the day we call them goths or neuros, short for new romantics. And then, uh, but even within that group, we created all these rules. You are a goth kid if you wear black, but if you listen to country, you listen to hip hop, or you listen to Bob Marley, you're a wannabe, you're a sellout, and the and the and the worst one, a poser. Oh, when I was growing up, if you were being called a poser, that's like, yeah, yeah that's, that's a big like, one. That's, that's a big thing. So <laughs> And that's how we, you know, not just the God kids, but the hip hop crew, the the country boys, and every single, even cholos and gangsters had that rules that everyone domesticated each other, conditioned each other, and we did with with romance as well and professionalism and all kind of thing. We are the result of domestication. Self acceptance is almost like a revolutionary thing. Is bucking that, you know, to stop that cycle. The best way to let go of conditional love is forgiving ourselves for saying yes to it in the first place. There's a quote that I absolutely love. It comes from the First Lady, Eleanor Roosevelt, who said this, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. Yeah. That's the quote. Paraphrasing, no one can make me feel inferior without my consent. Another form of paraphrasing, no one can domesticate me without my consent. All that domestication, all that conditioning, only have power over me because I keep saying yes to it. And like I was saying earlier in the conversation, the truth exists whether you believe in it or not, but a belief only exists for as long as you believe it which means that, that image by which we domesticate ourselves is just a belief. The word perfection means something that is completely free of any flaw. And then we begin to domesticate ourselves with that image. In order to be worthy of love, I have to be this perfect image of myself. Don Miguel Ruiz doesn't take things personal, doesn't make assumptions, always does his best. <gasps> I forgot the fourth agreement. Oh no, how can I promise not <laughs> Don Miguel Ruiz? I don't know the fourth agreement. Bad and son. <laughs> yeah, and there's the judgment. Yeah, I'm a bad son, I'm a bad Toltec. And there's the, that's the, there's the downward spiral, that diatribe of judgment for punishing myself to not living up to the image of perfection, of, in my case, of Don Miguel Ruiz Jr., who doesn't take things personal, doesn't make assumptions, always does his best. And He's impeccable with this word. Thank you very much. The telltale sign that we use the four agreements as an instrument of domestication is judging ourselves for taking things personal, judging ourselves for making assumptions, judging ourselves for the rest of it. At that moment, we're not practicing the four agreements, we're practicing the four conditions. The four conditions are instruments of domestication. It's the way we corrupt Don Miguel Ruiz, Deepak Chopra, Marianne Williamson, Jesus, Buddha, Siddhartha, Muhammad, psychology, psychiatry, Alcoholics Anonymous, and like example before, music, fashion, style, politics, religion. We corrupt all these beautiful traditions that allows us to embrace unconditional love, to enjoy life, but we're so attached to domestication that we will corrupt all of it. We corrupted music. If you listen to this kind of band, you're cool. If you listen to this other kind of band, you're a square, you're a nerd, you're a poser especially if you pretend to say you like this band, <laughs> but you don't know any of the songs. Yeah, you're you can just say, yeah, I know that one. That's a good yeah, one. Exactly. <laughs> it's yeah, a yeah. great movie. <laughs> yeah, and you only say it because you want to fit in. Exactly. And that's what they call you a poser. Mm. They're going to find me out at any given moment. No one can make me feel inferior without my consent. Those domesticated images are only there because I believe them. I believe them. Like I said before, perfection is something that is completely free of any flaw. Well, guess what? We define a flaw with agreements. Everything in life is perfect because it exists in nature. The only place where a flaw ex exists is in our minds in the form of in our society. What's acceptable, what's not, what's beauty, what's not. 
and it's always changing. The image of beauty has changed so much in the last 70 years that, you know, would the image of Marilyn Monroe or Elvis Presley still be an image of beauty today? And it's changed time and time again. So we can say, whenever I judge myself, I'm using my own intent, meaning my yes, that gives power to my judgment, power to impact me. The flaws in my, when I look at myself in the mirror, are only there because I agree with it, and I'm using it against myself. Mm. In other words, I'm not being impeccable with my word. I'm using my own intent, my own word, to go against me, to reinforce whatever judgment I have of me. So self-acceptance comes the moment where I realize that I've been using my agreements, the things I'm saying yes to, to say that I'm not worthy of my own love. Time and time again. Let's say that the perfect image of myself is to be 27 years old, weigh 170 pounds, and have long flowing hair like you. You have good hair. <laughs> now I look at myself in the mirror, and that's just not the truth. I weigh 190 pounds. I'm 45 years old, and this is the truth of my hair. If I look in the mirror and I don't live up to that image of perfection, then I'm going to judge myself, punish myself, castigate myself with, you fat, you <laughs> bald fat, you old bald fat. <laughs> That's judging myself. I am rejecting yeah. myself to an image that doesn't exist. And here's the thing. Whenever we look at ourselves in the mirror and we feel the sting of that judgment, understand that that agreement only exists because we believe someone else. Someone's agreement of what beauty is, what someone's agreement of what a man is, or what success is, or what's cool, what's not. It's always changing. Always changing because our agreements are constantly changing the way we view the world. So from that point of view, if you look in the self in the mirror and feel the sting of your own rejection, understand that what you're hearing in your mind is impacting you because you continue to believe it. No one can make you feel inferior without your consent. The way we give consent is by saying yes to it. In other words, by believing it. But like I said before, a belief only exists for as long as you say yes to it. You're completely free to change your mind and say no to it. In the Toltec tradition, there's nothing to learn but to unlearn, mm. to let go of all those things that doesn't allow us to see ourselves. So from that point, more point of view, to accept yourself just the way you are is to no longer project an image of who I'm supposed to be, but to take a breath and enjoy being the experience of who you are. This is who you are. Take a deep breath. And know that you are alive right now. And that's all you need. You don't need to convince anyone of your worth. Because you're alive right now. And understand all those things by which you rejected yourself before only had power because you believed it. And they stopped having power over you the moment you no longer believed it. Don Miguel. That was so much wisdom. I really, really love the conversation. I know it's going to help a lot of people. Um, I know we're coming up on the hour. I wanted just to ask you before a final wrap up question that we do at the end of every podcast is first of all, where can people find you? Where can people learn more about you? Where can they get your incredible books, listen to you more? I know some people are going to want to hop on this wisdom and, and get more of that information. So wh where can people learn more? Well, thank you so much. Um, our home base is our website, miguelruiz.com. That's my father's website, but it's also the website for my brother and myself. I also have my own, which is Miguel Ruiz JR, Miguel Ruiz Jr.com. And yes, we're on social media and Facebook and Instagram, but that's our, our home base. In regards to our book, your local bookstore will have it. Yeah, that's Mastery of Self. The five levels of attachment. Uh, 
you have a lot of a lot of books um so i, I recommend yeah, yeah. people diving deep and i'm about to release my new one uh the mastery of life in october oh That's the one. okay okay we'll make sure to tell our people that that it's coming out um okay so one of the wrap of questions we have at the end is related to what i mentioned uh the podcast is about is what in your life is it that allows you to tap in within allows you to unleash those internal sources of energy that you have to unleash the untapped potential inside you um, those extraordinary capabilities whether it's physical mental spiritual emotional what is that in in your life faith in one word um to explain that let me put it to you this way about eight years ago i started to go for a run now i was recovering from an injury from my sciatic nerve and both legs fell asleep and i severely uh, twisted both ankles so i had to learn how to walk again so one day i started to go for a run with my friend uh shane and I was barely able to run two miles, which is what, uh, three kilometers, four kilometers, something like that. I was barely able to finish that, but I wanted to run. And at that point, all my the physical activity I've had was playing soccer or football, but I couldn't play like that anymore. It, 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 those days of, of playing soccer were gone because I couldn't move left or right the way I used to be able to. But I still wanted to run uh, to exercise, so I ran. So I continued the path, and I adapted. I learned this. I, I created a system, which is I created a playlist where I would walk one song, run one song, walk one song, run, and then that's the interval: one, walk, two, run. So little by little, I added one song, walk. Then I would run two songs. Then it became three songs. Then it became four songs, walk run uh, once on walk and that's the interval until I was able to run a whole uh, hour. The first time I ran five miles in my life, mm. it was an incredible experience because I crossed a threshold. My mind, my self-doubt told me I couldn't cross and I proved it wrong. Yeah. I proved my self-doubt wrong. I ran five miles. And it was a phenomenal experience because the best question in my life came at me at that moment. What else can I do? And I answered anything. I like to prove my self-doubt wrong and cross thresholds. My self-doubt told me I couldn't cross. When I cross them, it feels great because I am unleashing my own un, my own potential because I am bringing down all the barriers that I told myself I couldn't cross, and I did, time and time again. Faith is believing in something one hundred percent, as in contrast to blind faith. Faith is knowing that I can take a step forward, that I can move, that I can dance, that I can utter a word. I'm alive. That's what faith is. I know I can take a step forward, which reminds me of what a teacher once said. The key to enlightenment is effort. That's it. That's all you need for enlightenment, effort. Effort is using the energy that animates this body, that animates this mind to manifest something, which is a step, an action, a word. That's what effort is. Discipline is remembering to apply that effort every day. That's it. You don't need the drill sergeant in your head. All you have to do is just remember to say yes to that effort. And success is following through on that effort. Well, I love that analogy. And thank you for sharing that story. Uh, I, I hope you're still running further five miles, hopefully I know you do marathons, so I've run I've run six full marathons and about twenty five half marathons, and because of COVID, I haven't been able to run one, so I switched over to kickboxing, and now I'm kickboxing. Wow, amazing! So, uh, uh, cardio, cardio kickboxing. I don't actually yeah. fight. I just train my body, and it's it's been fun. So 
I'm looking forward to the day where I'm able to run a race. I do still run, of course. I enjoy, you know, there, there's something that happens, you know, when after mile three or, uh, or mile four, my mind shuts up and it's all silent. And all that is is my body, my environment, and my mind comes back around mile 10 or 11 when it says it's almost time to finish. You can still do it. <laughs> one more mile, Miguel, one more mile. It comes back like a coach. Yeah. So. It's a wonderful experience. Yeah, it's because you've cultivated a, a narrator, an inner voice that is your ally, not your parasite, as you as you call it, as we were yeah, saying exactly. before. You can almost say that's the whole work, the redemption of the mind, where I no longer use it as my active domesticator. Mm -hmm. It becomes my ally. Amazing. Thank you for leaving us with that. Don Miguel Same. Ruiz, uh, Jr., I'm so happy that we could connect, brother. Um, thank you for your time today, your wisdom. I took away so much, and I know all these all these teachings are are planting that seed of consciousness in our in our minds that will hopefully not when we're 27, but you know, <laughs> start manifesting uh, soon in our lives because this wisdom is very powerful. And I thank you for having the courage to to communicate it with a larger audience. Oh, my pleasure, Emilio. Thank you so much. Once again, congratulations on your graduation. Enjoy <laughs> Thank you. fun and enjoy your next steps in life. You will thrive and you will succeed as long as you enjoy every moment of it. Yes, 100%. Thank you so much. Cheers. Gracias.